Hello, I'm Pastor Boyles. I want to welcome you to our Ajax Turner Senior Center Bible Study from 5 October 2022. Here today, as we look at Amos chapter 5, verses 4 through 15. And the message today is entitled, Seeking God. And the background for our text is going to come from Amos chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, all the way through chapter 6, verses 14. But as a way of introduction, when Amos came onto the scene and he began preaching uh, God's word, this was a new kind of prophet, a prophet who was unlike those that had preceded him. In fact, there had only been about 30 or 40 years between the death of Elisha and the preaching of Amos. However, there, there had become a major shift in the culture of Israel. And in the earlier days where there had been such an onslaught of pagan idolatry that the people had almost forgotten who God was, then the powerful works of Elijah, his miraculous works of Elijah and Elisha would help the people to remember, to be able to remember their heritage. And in fact, that they were God's chosen people. They had been set apart and set aside and that God was the Lord of the universe the creator of heaven and earth. However, it would come to pass that despite their newfound remembrance of God, they began to enjoy their prosperity, to grow lazy and become disobedient to the teachings of God. And they were no longer being people who had found their newfound remembrance, but rather ones who were now becoming tolerant of their old ways of idolatry. And this was going to bring about a different shift, a shift in the type of prophet that would be required, that God would use and that arose in Israel. No longer would it be a prophet who would perform mighty works. On the contrary, These were going to be prophets who would be mighty in word. Prophets who preached with authoritative messages that came directly from God. Messages that would one day be found in our Bibles. And Amos was perhaps the first of these new prophets. A new world power had arisen on the scene, a, a nation that was referred to and called to as Assyria. And all during the times of Elijah and Elisha, the primary threat to Israel had been the, the nation of Aram, but we know that as modern day Syria. But the fact is that the warfare that took place there were, were more often border disputes, skirmishes, uh, and we wouldn't look at those today as being all out wars. In fact, Aram really may never have done a strong conquest of Israel. With one exception, that was the city of Ramoth Gilead on the far eastern border of the original tribal land of Israel. But this was about to change. The new world power rising to the north of Aram, Tilgar Pilsar. The third had arisen to the throne in Assyria and he had begun campaigns of conquest. Amos was receiving visions of the desolation that would fall upon Israel under these future Assyrian kings. And this is what he begins to describe in chapter five in those first three verses leading up to our lesson today. And then at the conclusion of chapter 5, in that latter part of the chapter, Amos is going to prophesy that the day of the Lord would come. But it would not be as though the people had believed the day of the Lord would be. In fact, it would be absolutely different. You see, they thought the day of the Lord would be one of victory for the nation, that God would make Israel rule the world. However, Amos prophesized that it would be a day of severe judgment. What he would say is that it would be escaping from a lion to run only into a bear, upon entering one's home to rest, only to be bitten by a snake 
from the wall. God was angry with the great hypocrisy of his people's religious observances, and he would bring about justice against sin. Today, how do we go to worship? Do we worship God in spirit and truth? Or do we go to God to see who else is there? And does everybody see who I am and the, the car I'm driving and the, the outfit that I have? In our scripture, Amos cries out, let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never ending stream. In chapter six, Amos prophecies that God will condemn the pride of Israel. He shows contempt for the proud conceit of the wealthy who lie on beds of ivory, lounging on couches, dining on choice lambs and fatted cattle, listening to the harp music, drinking wine by the bowlfuls and using the finest lotions. The rich do all these things. And it says in 6.6, reading from the NIV, do not grieve over the ruin of Jacob. For he promises them that their fasting and feasting rather and lounging will come to an end. So if you haven't been with us through the entire study, let me just give you a general outline of, of Amos, what we've seen, what's going on. That in chapters one and two, there's the judgment against the nations that we talked about. These are the nations around Israel. Then there's the five prophetic sermons that follow in three through six that we're we're hearing a part of today. Five prophetic visions in chapter seven through chapter nine, verse 10. And then there's the blessing and renewal for Israel that we'll read about in chapter nine, verses 11 through 15. But to bring you back up to speed, let me just say that God, we learned from our lesson last week that he, God is going to hold in contempt those who indulge themselves while oppressing the poor. That giving sacrifices to God when disobeying him makes him angry. That God brings severe judgment on the land and the people when they sin against him. He holds all persons accountable. And today's lesson we're going to learn that if you seek God, excuse me, you will be blessed. But on the contrary, if you do not, then know this, you will suffer. For those who refuse to know God will discover that their lives will sometimes crash and burn. However, the good news is that when we hate evil and do good, we can hope for God's mercy to come. Well, once again, let me just go to that preceding passage of scripture that comes in Amos 5 verses 1, three, 1 through 3, where Amos prophecies that despite its prosperity, Israel has fallen and will experience disaster. To that extent, that is done. Israel is going to fall. Who is going to be the remnant? That is yet to be determined. But the fact is, judgment is going to come. And so the lesson that we ought to learn is also given in Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God's not disappearing from the scene because he's going to bring judgment. He's still remaining there for those who have a sincere plea to seek God. And this is what we find in the verses of Amos 5, 4 through 7. Sound familiar? For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. The full section of scripture in our study today presents that description of what it means to seek the Lord in truth. The word begins with seek me in verse four and then concludes with seek God and not evil in verse 14 and 15. So the message is into the entire house of Israel. The message today is into all that are here within the sound of my voice, that if we seek good and not evil, God is still there. God is still listening as we've learned from previous lessons. He's speaking to his family. But they have to abandon their hypocritical and distorted views of worshiping God and the social injustice that has saturated society. They 
we're going to have to repent, and seek justice in the land. Follow along in your scripture at verse five, it says, but do not resort to Bethel and do not come to Gilgal nor cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. You see, not too long ago, if you use the uh, once upon a time, if you will, those were places of true worship to God. Bethel was once literally the house of God, a shrine that had been set up by Jacob and Gilgal, the location of the tabernacle. Beersheba, if you remember, was the site of the well dug by Abraham. However, all these sites now had become tainted by idol worship and pagan ritual. Use of these cities now had become a stench to God. Amos prophecies that these sites will be destroyed. I think sometimes we can look at some of the churches today that are, are missing the message of the gospel and missing the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And I can tell you that I believe those churches will be destroyed. But in verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord that ye may live, for he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench it for Bethel. I don't know if you've ever seen those raging fires out of control anywhere, like in California, other than on the news, but I can tell you, Amos was saying that if you seek the Lord, you will be spared the judgment. But he was saying otherwise. And make no mistake, God would break out like a fire that ravishes and destroys everything in its path. The house of Joseph refers to that tribe of Ephraim because Ephraim was the son of Joseph. Ephraim was the largest tribal land in the kingdom of Israel. And thus the nation itself was often called Ephraim. Bethel being the predominant city of Israel in its earlier years and where much of the leadership lived. However, when the fire of God's judgment breaks out, Bethel would be destroyed and no one would be available to quench the fire. Today, we must be concerned ourselves with those who are in positions of authority who seek to abuse their leadership and their power. But I rest assured that the same consequences the same results will occur for them that Amos prophesied. And in verse 7, it says, For those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth. What is it saying here? It's saying that such judgment would fall upon those leaders who turn justice into wormwood. What is wormwood? Wormwood was a plant that, that was bitter, extremely bitter to taste and poisonous if you took too much. This then is symbolic of the expression indicating that justice now had become so corrupt that it was a bitter experience for its exposure to the righteous. I can't help but believe that in many cases we're seeing this reoccur today. That our justice system has become one in which there is unequal justice, truly misused and misguided. And Amos gives a serious warning against opposing God in chapter 5, verses 8 through 13. So if you've got your Bibles, continue to follow along with me. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night and who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out, on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Do you know who God is? Because Amos is trying to do that right now. The inflection of his words and the words that he has written. He is reminding his listeners who God is. He is the Lord who is the creator. Who made the heavens and the earth. 
The references to the, the Pleiades are the seven stars, which are small and brilliant cluster of stars that shine near the constellation of Taurus. Some have referred to it as the jewel of the nighttime sky. Orion is that easily recognized constellation that we refer to as the hunter. It is God who has that power to turn day into night, to control the raging sea and cause the water to rain upon the earth. And his name is Yahweh, great God of Israel. Are you ready to proclaim God is who he is, that he is God of heaven and earth, and that Jesus is the only way, he is the truth and the life. Verse 9, it is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. And following along in the text, what we're able to discern is that he is the same God, says Amos. This is the same God, the God of lightning who flashes destruction upon the strongest men in cities and nations, sending destruction even upon the strongest forces of men. He's the same God. He's in control of everything. And in verse 10, it sounds like they said, they hate him who reproves in the gate and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. You think that's not happened today? You think they're not trying to silence the churches and the message of the gospel on every avenue that they can in TV, movies, books? The they here refers to the people of Israel, but the they that I'm speaking about are those in the world today who refuse and oppose the message of the word of God. Who don't stand up for what is right in the city gates where the elders render judgment and verdicts in silver matters. They abhor or show contempt for those who speak up for what is right. I might ask, are you who or they? Which side are you on? For in verse 11, it says, Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-honed stone, yet you will not live in them. You've planted a pleasant vineyard, yet you will not drink their wine. Amos is speaking to those who have taken their great wealth and taken the great things that God has bestowed them with and used it to to not only increase their situation, but to diminish that of others by exacting unfair rental charges and demanding unjust payments of grain. And when we do that, whether it's charging someone too much rent or or trying to take advantage of the poor and the hopeless, Amos prophesies that those through the wealthy have built houses of finely honed stone and planted great vineyards. They will not live in those houses or reap the benefit of those vineyards. In fact, the ultimate destination is heaven or hell. And you're not going to need any of the wealth that you have today in heaven. Because you're not going to live in this house and you're not going to live in the house you live in now. And God's going to send his judgment through a conquering nation. That's what he's telling the people of Israel. But one day Jesus will return. And those who believe in him will be swept up. In verse 12 it says, For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. Listen, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So don't try to think that you're not in this picture. You who distress the righteous and accept the bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. You may have a hard time trying to remember where you've ever done that or you've caused someone to stumble. But I can tell you that the message that Amos is saying, God saw and counted the great number of both sins and ignorant wrongs and transgressions. Rebellious, deliberate wrongs, but he also recognizes those that we ought not to have done that we did not know we committed. The leaders have corrupted justice, trampling over the righteous, and rejected any support for the help for the poor among the elders at the city gate. Verse 13. 
It says, therefore, at such a time, the prudent person keeps silent. I want you to think about this. Let me go back to the scripture. It says, for it is an evil time. You think this is an evil time? Do you think that prudent people don't keep silent today? Those who are in charge of disseminating justice and so corrupt that the truly righteous person will say nothing because he deems it wise to stay out of trouble by keeping his mouth shut? How many are intimidated by the wokeness culture of the world today, afraid to speak what you already know, that there is one man and one woman, and that's the way a, a wedding ought to be? I appeal to you, Amos, who says strong wisdom in loving God. In verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you just as you have said. Are you willing to stand up for what you believe? Amos was saying, if you truly seek to do what is right and good and you turn away from evil, then you will live in the blessing that God will truly be with you. Oh, but I've got to have all these things. If I don't, then who am I? And the people were in a habit of saying, God will be with you or God is with us. But Amos is reminding them, if you truly do what is right, then God really will be with you. Our conclusion in this, in verse 15, is very simple. Very simple for us today. Hate evil, love good. And establish justice in the gate. Establish justice in your home. Be fair to your children. Be just to your children. Perhaps the Lord of God hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Maybe, maybe your life is going to suffer, but it doesn't have to suffer with your children and your grandchildren. Amos was prophesying for the court system to change amongst the people. They were to hate evil and love good. And the application of what it would be to establish justice in the gate. But for us, there is a gate. This is our homes, our houses, what we teach and what we live and what we believe. Taking the message of God within our own households and communicating. A righteous king of a nation would enact a system by which justice would prevail amongst its people. And this establishment of justice was what Amos was telling the city leaders they were to do. It's so what I'm sharing with you as grandparents and parents that you are to do within the gates, within your own house. In the following passages of scripture that follow our text, verses 16 to 27, Amos is warning that people that the day of the Lord, contrary to what they think, will be a time of great judgment against God's own people. And that in Amos chapter 6, warns that the wealthy will become to horrible judgment, taking them by surprise and ending their comfortable lifestyle. And again, he's speaking to those that take their money and use it simply to, to, to hold it over other people. Join us next week as we look at our lesson about hope in God as we look at Amos 9, 5 through 15. May God bless you, keep you, and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until then, I look forward to having you join us next week.